just to get started, uh, the uh, first thing that I want to say is if you look, in fact, at the very first slide after my cover slide, what it says there is the law is whatever is boldly asserted and plausibly maintained. I will grant you it is a, a, a ringing quote by a rather dubious fellow in uh, U.S. history. But uh, nonetheless, I found it very apt for uh, what we're doing today. Uh, as a teacher of English, as a lecturer in English at this university, I have uh, a distinct fascination for the, the language used in the law, in particular, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I have a history of uh, going to law school myself. Uh, but in addition to that, um, I find that the law is a particularly potent area for language because so much of what we're doing, so much of the reality that's being shaped in the law is shaped by the words that are being used. So I'm very happy uh, to be here today and likewise uh, to be participating on November 17th in this particular program. Now, uh, who uh, am I? As I said, I'm Mark Fatullo. I'm a lecturer in English uh, working out of Tilburg University Language Center. So we are the folks at this university who provide basically all of the language skills support to the, uh, to the various uh, schools and faculties uh, at this institution. And that includes, obviously, uh, the law school. So if we look at the two parts, what are we doing? In these sessions, uh, today's session is supposedly, as I said, the more theoretical of the two. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a number of different issues, among other things, uh, what we in uh, the English uh, teaching world call lexicon building. So basically looking at vocabulary, terminology, uh, the word level of things. I also want to talk to you uh, about a number of kind of key grammatical uh, issues that have to do with expression. So things like uh, uh, the use of the future and some points also on the limitations of English and uh, issues that have to do with translation, et cetera. But key to all of this, if you look at this, is what we're going to be looking at is, in essence, also the flexibility of language, the degree to which you have opportunities to actually throw stuff out there in a, a different language. And one of the things that I know among uh, both students and professionals alike is an issue is that a lot of people feel that the moment they leave their mother tongue, that they're leaving behind whole areas of their expressive toolbox. And one of the things that I try to do is to bring that back in so that we're looking and saying, OK, all of that power that you have in one language Let's try to get some of that back in in the second language so that you can, in fact, function at the level of professionalism that you would uh, desire of yourself in the first language as well. Uh, OK, then, as I said, the 17th, this is a workshop. We'll be discussing uh, points of language and legal communication in the context of your practice. One of the things that I'm going to request of you at the end of today's session is I have a, lit, a, a kind of grocery list of things that I'd like for you to look for. And that includes, for example, to the degree possible. Because as I said, I realize that in the context of your professional activities, a good deal of what takes place is perhaps confidential or is not meant for public uh, dissemination. Uh, but within those limitations, to look for materials that you can say, well, this is something typically I would have to communicate about in English, say, with members of the commission, with other uh, uh, individuals within the profession, other judges, lawyers, advocates, et cetera. Uh, or could be that you're saying, I just have general issues with English that I would like to see discussed. And here are examples of the type of writing and communication that I face in that respect. And then the other thing that I usually ask for is just uh, in that sense, the coverall of any other questions you may have, that you write them down and send them to me. And then if I have them in advance, I can more effectively deal with them even than questions from the floor, however desirable indeed those questions from the floor actually are. So in that respect, that's what I will, will be, we will be looking at at that point in time. Now, what is the problem that you're facing? What have I been set with? Well, if we look at the context of the course, 
you need to communicate with a number of different people. And this is where things get really interesting, because the first is you're looking and you're saying fellow members of the judiciary are probably going to be uh, on your list of people you will need to communicate with in English, looking at it as the lingua franca of uh, now extant and forming European law. And certainly with respect to tax law, this is going to become an issue. So indeed, you have to be up to date on the, the terminology, but also in a sense, the codas and uh, what you might call the habits and fashions of the, of the speech within the profession. Uh, you will also uh, have to discuss things with uh, individuals, for example, at the level of the European Commission. And of course, there, it could be that while in the first instance, you're talking to fellow lawyers, fellow legal scholars, it could also be that you will be dealing with individuals who are not, who are policymakers coming out of different areas. And that can also provide challenges of its own. And then finally, or rather in that respect, also therefore non-legal authorities at the level of, uh, at the European level. Now this is what I came up with specifically for the context of this course. Obviously, what you see is that the more internationally uh, uh, busy you become in any profession, the more you have to start communicating in English with a wide variety of people. But I'm looking for the specific context of this course. This was, in a sense, uh, the list that I came up with. And then I added to that in order to discuss, obviously, keep within the thematics, the specifics of state law, the interface with uh, European legislation and policy making, uh, with regard to the, the desirability for the desirability for a lack of state aid in any given situation with respect to tax law and all of the wonderful variegated things that come with that. So uh, 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 all of those issues that you've been discussing, such as transfer pricing, um, uh, warping of economic uh, systems, uh, uh, competition, et cetera, et cetera. So, now, what do I do in cases like this? What am I looking at? Well, obviously, with, again, I seem to be saying obviously a lot today. I should be careful about that. Um, if you look at this, we have 10 hours. We have four hours today. We have about six contact hours on the 17th. You have independent study. What I can do in that time is, of course, limited. There's only so much that can take place. So what I tend to do, and if we look then at the goals for the course, what you see is I look at problem, possible problem areas. So that's what I've done beforehand, is I looked at the materials that you've been given. What kind of language are they using? What could be stumbling points? What do I know from my experience as a teacher, a translator, a corrector, et cetera, et cetera, are typically points that people stumble at. And then what we try to do is we look at those areas in order to alleviate those particular problems to improve your ability to express yourself in English about, in this case, the law, specifically the law as it pertains to state aid and tax law. So that's very much, as I said, where we're going and where we will be going throughout this course. That being said, I need to issue a word of warning. Uh, one of the things that typically comes up in courses like this, and this is something that, again, came up also in my discussion before. Uh, okay. <laughs> before um, uh, I undertook this, uh, this course, is that people are often talking about the ability to translate, the ability to, in essence, mediate from one language to another. And I always tell people, and again, if you look at the keep in mind that I have, do keep in mind that if you look at this, the ability to speak one language is a skill. The ability to speak another language is a skill. That does not include the ability to translate from the one to the other. That is an entirely different skill set. Learning how to translate properly is basically like learning a third language altogether. So on the whole, I will grant you, I have a bit of a bias in this respect, having been a former professional translator. But I do tell people basically that 
if you're facing really bulk text or bulk uh, levels of communication that need to be translated, you do absolutely need to go to a professional with this because doing it yourself is simply not going to work. So that's one thing. The other thing then that I tell people is if you're going to be working in English on your own, as I said, learning to speak a second language is a skill set. You can do this, and that's fine. But then what you have to learn to not do is to not translate. You have to start really thinking compartmentalized. So in that sense that you say, when I'm working on something in English, and I'm going to be communicating in English, I am not going to think of it first in Dutch, in German, in Italian, I'm going to go straight to English. I'm going to look within the boundaries of my own proficiency. What can I say with my toolbox in English to get my point across? Because the danger is that if you first think of it in Dutch, German, Italian, what you're going to do is start translating, and that's where trouble starts. So in that sense, you really have to start thinking in uh, that light. And of course, the one thing that I also add that's always, as I said, I have a distinct fascination with, uh, with, the lang with law and the language is in addition to the common challenge of moving from any language into another and communicating effectively at a professional level, you're also in legal systems that differ. So they often have, even, even when discussing the same term, may actually be referring to different things. Uh, in that respect, one of the things that I remember from uh, both law school and uh, uh, translating is that if you start looking at terms like, for example, in what is called in Dutch, I do not know it in German and Italian, unfortunately, uh, but Omerik Matige Dat is then commonly translated in dictionaries as tort law. The truth is there's very subtle differences between these things. The, the boundaries of what constitutes Omerik Matige Dat and what constitutes torts are actually different areas. There's a, if you had a Venn diagram, there'd be a huge degree of overlap. I will grant you this. There are those areas where, in each case, it falls outside of it. So you have to be very careful when you're also looking at your own legal system and trying, in a sense, not just to translate linguistically, but also to translate legally. That, that can be an issue as well. Is it, is it for example, so correct that fiscal law is not the same as fiscal recht? Uh, to some degree, that's actually true, because uh, if I'm correct, uh, what is commonly called fiscal recht in the Netherlands is more limited, I thought, to tax law. And if I'm correct, fiscal law is actually a greater boundary. It also has to do with accounting law. Yeah. And, and so right away, you're seeing those yeah. kind of differences. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So indeed, that's something that needs to be, uh, uh, you need to watch for. Um, so yeah, so what I'm looking at is then, if we look at the approach, as I said, I look at grammar, structure, vocabulary, idiom issues. Right now, what you saw is typically an issue of vocabulary and terminology translation. Uh, I also look at the uh, attitudes and mores behind choices that are made. One of the things that I often tell people is not, this is not just about the how, but it's about the why we do certain things that uh, makes sense, so that's up there as well. And to start, I've got something for you. I want to throw something out there. So now dig in right away into the, the meat and potatoes of, uh, of English, as it were. I want you to look, if you look at, for example, the slide, the following statements. It says, discovery X from study Y. OK, that's not a statement. That's actually a non-sentence. I will grant you that. But it's, it gives us a basic structure. So you have something being discovered from looking at something else. Now, we could, I could just really easily solve this. I could say, how do I put this into a good, correct sentence? I could say, we investigated X and discovered Y. But now I'm going to ask you something. What's going on in that sentence? First of all, where am I putting the emphasis? Who is getting a lot of attention in this sentence?
Actually, I think it switched X and Y around. Yeah, yeah. My apologies. Yeah, okay, uh, I see yeah. it now. okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. investigated Y and discovered X. I just saw that. I saw you looking at it, and then I realized what I was doing. My apologies. See, it's good to have judges. What can I say? Okay, but if you look at the sentence with the correction added, my apologies. What? Where's the where's the emphasis in a sentence like this? Who gets a lot of attention? Anyone? It's rather equal because of the end. Okay, we did investigated X and discovered Y, but what's the subject of the sentence? We. So, in fact, if you look at this, who's getting the most attention? It's whoever is doing this. So you say, we investigated X and discovered Y. Now, we is fairly bland, it's a pronoun, but if you say you fill in something like, uh, uh, the committee on X, the, the A, B, and C investigated X, or investigated Y and discovered X, what you'll quickly see is that the subject is getting a huge degree of emphasis. But what if you don't want it? What if it's not about the people? What if it's just about the thing? So what if it's about the process and not the actors in that sense? Well, then that's the thing. If you look further, so however, what do you see? We could also say, for example, X was investigated, Y was discovered. Hey, look at that. Now we've worked someone out of the system. So now we're saying that it's actually more about the activity that took place and the results, and not so much about who did it. And in that respect, that creates a different dynamic. So right away, you're saying you're putting the emphasis somewhere else. And I give you examples like this because this is typically what people identify when they say, I don't have enough space in the second language. Because what happens is, in your first language, you automatically do these things. You say, oh, I want the emphasis to be a little different, switch your pitch, and you switch around. But in a second language, you're often happy to have one or two solutions, and then you kind of leave it. Because consider this. What if I say, you know what? I think this sentence is a little dead. It doesn't have much dynamism. It's basically all in the past tense. It's a parallel construction, so it works, it's solid. But maybe I want to have more dynamism. So then I would do something like this. Investigating X, we discovered Y. Look at that. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking one of the elements out of the main sentence. I'm basically saying, using it as what you'd call a modifier phrase. I'm saying what the rest of this sentence is about can be placed in the context of this particular thing. So investigating this, this is the result that came out. Wow, terrific. I could also, but maybe, well, now let me ask you this. What about this? What have I done here? The same with more words. <laughs> yeah, basically, and there's a reason for that. What re Now, first of all, what I've done is this is what's called nominaliza nominalization. So basically what I've said is I've got a whole bunch of um, verbals. So I have a, a bunch of verbs to investigate, to discover, to react, whatever kind of ver verb you want. And I say I want to turn them into nouns. I want to make those elements... I want them to not be actions, I want them to be things. Now, what happens when you do that? And you get the investigation of X led to the discovery of Y. So I have to add another verb. I have to add, uh, for example, things like um, prepositions. So of the, the, or to this, led, et cetera, et cetera. So you get a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you get a greater number of words, a greater mass. What does nominalization do in a sentence? It slows you down as a reader. And sometimes that can be the point 
And certainly in legal argumentation, when you're trying to persuade someone of the essence of something, that something is important, not because it is necessary an activity, but because it is a concept or a thing, you want to slow your reader down that little bit. So sometimes you do this, you actually take the dynamism back out of the sentence. So you say, it's about investigation, it's about discovery. And those are things, it's tactile, it's concrete, and it slows your reader down a little bit. You want to be wary of doing this, because if you slow your readers down too much, they'll get bored and they'll walk away. But the truth is, it is sometimes a mechanism that you want to use. Of course, it could be that what you're really trying to do is explain something. So it's not just about the relationship. It's not that you're looking and saying, it's about the investigation and the discovery. It's that you say, it was only by doing this that we were able to find out a certain thing. And again, think of how the law works, law, legal argumentation works. As often as not, you're not just trying to point out the relationships between things. You're trying to point out the essential relationships between things. So that you say, for example, yes, it's only by applying this particular set of rules that we will actually get the results that we desire. If we do not do this, we will not get that. So it was only in investigating X that became possible to discover Y. And then finally, what you could also do is you could make it, in that sense, more narrative. Having investigated X, we subsequently discovered Y. What am I doing here? What am I, first of all, what I'm trying to show you in that respect is, as I said, flexibility. We're looking at this and saying, this is about flexible use of language. This is about creating greater opportunity in language use. But what I'm also showing you is that even within, with just a number of, you know, Lego blocks, a limited number, there's a huge amount of potential to say different things. And that this is something that's often, well, this is something, by the way, that's often overlooked in first language uh, writing. That I often see people using very repetitive uh, means of communication. But the other end of this is that you also look and you say, yeah, I have different agendas with each of these different sentences. I'm trying to say something different each time, even though I'm communicating the same basic piece of information. So that's something that has to be kept in mind. Now, I wouldn't be an English teacher if I didn't then backtrack and say, what was I literally doing in looking at this? And then if we look at it in that sense, what is being done? If you look at that uh, slide, X was investigated and Y discovered. This is basically the use of what we call a passive construction. So I usually tell people, first way out of things, if I can just write briefly on the board, is one of the big things that people struggle with is I and we. So uh, I don't think you, yeah, let me see if I can, one second. Oh, that's. That's going to be difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really hard. I think I'm just going to say it in this respect. So, but basically, I and we. So, if we look at uh, pronouns, first person, what we call the first person perspective in that respect, that's a problem because in many cases, people are trying to eliminate that from uh, their uh, formal communications. Now, again, question: Why would you? Why would you want to do that? Why do you need to get yourself out of the picture? <clears throat> Anyone? Maybe because it's not about us. Exactly. What are you supposed to be doing? I mean, this is your this is, you know, your profession among and above perhaps many others is about objectivity. You're supposed to be looking at the facts. You're supposed to be adjudicating, not based on opinion as such, not based on personal experience, emotion, any of those things, but looking objectively at the facts, giving a solid academic legal analysis, 
coming to a conclusion that can be seen as being equitable for multiple parties, or at least seen as acceptable for multiple parties, not necessarily even equitable. But the fact is, in order to do that, you have to watch your language use, that it's often not about you. It's about what is being said and what is being done. And that's where passive constructions are great. Because in that sense, if you look at it and from that perspective, then that's how you get constructions where you say, you know, it's not about, well, I or we feel that this is the case, but no, it is the opinion of the court that X must be taken into consideration in dealing with Y in order for this to be seen as falling within the legal boundaries of Z. So yes, you have to do these things. Uh, I will point something out, by the way. Writing guides are allergic to the passive in this day and age. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that most writing guides are not written for lawyers or indeed for people working in this type of context. They're often written for, well, essentially individuals uh, trying to sell things. But whether it's literally things, so business people, but also even within the academic community, the, the market of our ideas is often seen as a place where things are sold in that sense. And we're often being asked to put these things out there on that level. And there's another reason for this. And the other reason is, in a sense, this room. The more international audiences for English get, the more that we're seeing. Oh, did I just stop on something? Sorry about that. Uh, the more, hey, that's funny. Just give me a second here. Sorry, guys. The more that uh, more international audiences get, the more you see there a need for accommodation. And what do we mean by that? That you need to keep your language as streamlined and as accessible as possible. And one thing we can say as, and your name now eludes me again, was it Sarah? Sorry, Ed, 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 your name. Ed. Ed. What Ed pointed out uh, before is as soon as you start using more complex constructions and the passive is generally more complex than the active, it becomes longer, becomes a little more difficult to access. So there's a, a tendency when instructing writers within this in, or academic or international community to use active prose. But what did I just say? You're not there for the general world. You're there to put down very specific things for a very specific community. So in this sense, there is nothing wrong with the passive. So as I said, passive past tense formulation, Write a researcher as uh, no write a researcher as subject. Then you have investigating X. We discovered Y. There you're using. Uh, you do have a first person. Uh, in this case, you actually have to. I'm going to come back to that later. There's something called uh, the dangling modifier problem that we're going to discuss at a later point, and that relates to this. Uh, this uses what's called a gerund formulation. So there's ing things of you know thinking about this. We, just, we came to this. Working on this, we found this. Investigating X, we discovered Y. You have a question by any chance? A gerund is not familiar to us. Well, that was what I was just uh, getting to. What is a gerund formulation? It's any uh, of those verbs that end with ing. So like working, doing, finding. So in that sense, this case, what you have is investigating X, we discovered Y. And we call that, uh, and we call those, uh, this is in, in fact a gerund modification, because what are you doing? You're using that ing form of the verb, and what are you using it to do? You're using it to modify, to determine what's going to follow. So we discovered why. How do we discover why? By investigating x. And that's often a very nice kind of clean way of dealing with these things. So I find that that's one that's also nice to put out there. Uh, then, of course, what else do they talk about? Nominalization. So you have verbs. You have these actions that take place. So as you said, to investigate, to discover. But sometimes you want to turn them into nouns. You want to turn them into, uh, yeah, very simply, things, as it were. So in this case, I don't want to talk about discover or investigate. I want to talk about the discovery the investigation, that makes it more concrete. But what did we say? It also slows down your sentence. Excuse me? Yes. Indiana. Uh, for example, investigating X, uh, Y has been discovered. Would that be a possibility? 
No. Why not? And that was, <laughs> and that was what I was just getting around to when I talked about there's something in, in, in English, and in this case, I will very much try to do this just for a moment. In English, it's, uh, that's what we call a dangling modifier problem. And what's a dangling modifier problem? Well, give me your sentence again. Investigating X, Y has been discovered. Y has been discovered. Okay. Investigating X, Y has been discovered. Now, this is a modifier phrase. And what we mean by that is it's a phrase that's describing or discussing something else in the sentence. However, when you use a gerund like that, so one of these ing things, you're referring to something within the other sentence, not just the whole other sentence. Do you see where I'm coming from? So to give you an example, you could also have a sentence like this. Um, it's a, another version of modification is something like this. Um, Mark, comma, a brilliant teacher, comma, works in Tilburg. What is a brilliant teacher modifying? What is it saying something about? About Mark. About Mark. So it's saying something about the subject. Well, the same is true of this kind of construction. Investigating X has to say something about the subject. But what's the subject in this, in this sentence? Why? Yeah. But why didn't do the investigating? And that's what's called a dangling modifier construction. Because what we've essentially done is we've created an actor, uh, we in this case, that's outside of the sentence. And in English, you're not allowed to do that. But I'm going to tell you something. I have a prediction. Give this another 20 years, and it's going to be correcting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not kidding, because the truth is, people have been studying these types of constructions. Within the international community, this is so accepted because it's so clear what you're saying. But the rules of grammar as yet do not allow you to do that. So then as soon as you use a gerund, you're kind of stuck with using, uh, you have to have a subject that that construction, that that modifier phrase actually refers to. Now, as I said, we're going to discuss this, the whole uh, dangling modifier issue a little later on. I have really nice solutions for this. There are ways of getting around it that you don't always have to use we or I or involve yourself in the sentence. Does it revert right back to first person formulation? But you do have to uh, find other solutions to that. Okay, then if we look at the, the final sentence, what did we see was, uh, oh, well that was actually, uh, no, the, the final two sentences, then what we actually see is if you look at what is being done, it was only in investigating, then what you see here is again, you're using it now what are called verbal constructions, so basically in investigating this to discover that, that that's typically uh, a way to create an explanatory type of sentence. So that as soon as you start thinking in those senses of in this to do that, then you tend to get more of an explanatory or narrative motive, and that's usually uh, quite useful. And then finally, if you look at this, it says having investigated X, we subsequently discovered Y, then what you're using is that's true sequencing and narrative, and you're, you're actually using, in that case, a... Uh, and I'm going to come back to this later, what's called a perfective expression, in this case the present perfect, uh, having investigated to uh, come up with the idea of something took place in the past that has a connection to the present and therefore led the
that idea of the discovery was something that came later because of what went before. So that's very much uh, what's going on uh, in those cases. Now, what does this leave us with? Well, this brings me back to choices and possibilities, what I was talking about before. First of all, perspective can change, first person versus third person. So that's something that you that obviously needs some looking at. What else can change is active versus passive, what we call voice. So I'm going to be talking to you about the, the shifts in voice that take place. Momentary versus definitive, tense, time is something that's of the issue. And syntax, noun versus verbs. So there's choices of do I want to talk about an action or do I want to actually talk about a thing. And where this leads us, by the way, in that light, I can also point out as a footnote what could be added as I have here. Word choice, of course, also makes a difference. In this case, I had investigate and discover. Uh, 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 in that sense, keep in mind, there are also other words. And look how they would change what you're talking about. If you look at study, inquiry, probe, those have different what we call connotations. So to an investigation and a probe, have a very different connotation, a very different sense, an emotional load, as it were, than a word like study or inquiry do. And by the same token, discovery versus finding, revelation, and detection, to discover, to find, to reveal, to detect, those are very distinct words. They have very distinct qualities, as it were. And that's something we're going to come back to very, very quickly uh, in looking at this that, but at the end of the day, what are we all about? Well, if we look at this, the basics of any professional communication, certainly legal communication, is clarity, brevity, variety. What are you trying to do in each case? You want to be as clear as you possibly can in most cases. You want to be as brief as you possibly can, but you also want to be as varied as you possibly can. So you don't want to use overly repetitive language because that will, in that sense, turn off your readership. They'll, they'll, whether or not they actually cease to actually read what you're doing is uh, not necessarily the case, but they will start stop reading with the attentiveness that you desire of them. They won't be as compelled to read as you would like them to be. Okay, now, uh, where we left off is we're looking at, as I said, Kind of bringing this all together, and I said you, this leads you to kind of one of the first kind of key lessons in all written communication, but certainly in written communication in English, and certainly written communication in English about the law is that it all comes down to the banner of clarity, brevity, and variety. However, what you do see within this is that your mission will determine to what degree each of these things will play a greater role or a lesser role, and the degree to which you can actually define something as, for example, being brief or varied. And I want to show you something, because one of the things, again, within the field of the law that's often, that often throws people a little bit off is if you look at, um, uh, let's see, uh, if you look at the, ba the basics of uh, per uh, persuasive communication, if you look at that slide, it says that there are, in fact, two traditions that are very um, heavily represented within the field of the law. And they're, and they're both very, very different because they have to do with a distinction between, in that sense, uh, what you might call um, uh, logical persuasion versus maybe a more, um, a more ethical or moral form of persuasion. And uh, what's interesting is there's an author, and I, I I'll give you the reference uh, in, in this course as well, Brian Garner, and he's a scholar of uh, legal English in the United States, and he often breaks these things down and says that you have essentially two styles, and the one is what is known as the attic style, uh, and this is, the argument for proof. So when you're arguing in order to, in essence, prove a point, you use what's called the plain style or the attic style. 
but you also have what's called the vigorous style, the persuasive style. And this is often referred to as the Asiatic, and it has to do with where they originated as schools of rhetoric, uh, the, the first being, uh, if I'm correct, more central Greece, and the second being more uh, in the Middle East, so hence the term Attic versus Asiatic. Um, but what are we talking about here? And again, the reference, I can give you that, it's from Elements of Legal Style, uh, Brian Garner. A really good book, by the way, if you actually, if you're looking for any single author that you really want to say, this is a good person, uh, welcome back, the, to have a, a good look at is I would say Garner is definitely someone to look into. The only thing that I do have to add as a caveat is it does have uh, an American bias because he is from the United States. So all of his usages are American English. The spelling is American English. You do have to, if you're coming from the British school of, of learning, that takes a little bit of getting used to. But as he said, what he has to say remains valid for all forms of English. Um, but as I said, what are we talking about here? Well, this is basically that conflict between, and as I said, for, uh, I, I now finally truly have an audience that will really appreciate this. It's very much the language of the judiciary, is that often what you'll see is that people say that, for example, the, the language of judicial rulings can come across as being somewhat obtuse or and by that I mean uh, opaque, not you know, so not very transparent, and somewhat flowery and verbose. A lot of words are being used to say what many people say is often very little. But the truth is, there are often reasons for this, and I want to show you something as how this plays out. So, if you look at, for example, the slide on the attic. This is by way of Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the great uh, U.S. jurists, and he was uh, very much uh, a writer in the attic mode of, of doing things. And in this respect, if we look at this particular text, I'll just read off the, the board. Persecution uh, for the expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. So in essence, what he's saying is he's talking in this case about a case that had to do with censorship laws. And he's saying that we need, in a sense, why do we need to be so wary of censorship? And why do we, in fact, need to guard against infringements upon free speech? because it is so logical for any government to want to do this. Then it makes perfect sense. If you're in power, you don't want criticism because criticism could lead to your downfall or you're being hindered in your job. So, and he just basically puts it out there just like that. And I can, uh, uh, to allow opposition uh, by speech seems to indicate that you think speech impotent. So yes, no, indeed, we need to guard against this not because it's a, fr a frivolity on the part of government, but because it's an, an absolute instinct to want to do this. And he says it very, very clearly. He puts that forward in, by basically saying just that. This is as plain as the nose on your face. Speaking of which, another of uh, Holmes' rulings, he, he was talking uh, likewise about it had to do with a uh, license of activity and freedom of movement. And he said, it must be kept in mind that my freedom of movement ends where my neighbor's nose begins. Now, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, and that's very much what you would call the plain style. But what he's doing there is he's putting points forward and letting them stand for themselves. He's saying that basically, I can put this point forward and walk away. It stands as it stands. But his colleague, Benjamin Cardozo, thought otherwise. And if you look at the way he wrote, and it's interesting, this is from a ruling that uh, was authored by Cardozo. And you see here, the irony is what he's actually first discussing is not actually the case in point, but the type of language that he uses. And he's talking about it with respect to the particular case. The refined or artificial smelling a little of the lamp with its merits, it has its dangers. For unless well kept in hand, it verges at times upon preciosity and euphism. 
held in due restraint, it lends itself, lends itself admirably to cases where there is need of delicate precision. What he's arguing for is Asiatic language. He's saying that that's what, yes, indeed, it looks old fashioned. It can be uh, uh, euphistic. In other words, a lot of words for little being said. Preciosity, an obsession with the precision of language, but with due restraint, it lends itself admirably where there's need of delicate precision. And now, where does he find this need for delicate precision? I find no better organ on where the subject matter of discussion is the construction of a will with all its filigree of tentacles. So basically he's saying, yes, people who write their final testaments, their final wills, they are complex, but they need to be because they need to be precise, they need to get to, they need to be exact, and they can be counted on to be obsessive about exactly what is, needs to be done and takes place upon death. The shades of nuances of difference, the slender and fragile tracery that must be preserved, unmitigated, and distinct. Now, those are two very, that's a stark difference. And what you will often see is that you're going to be confronted with both. That you will see cases, you will have texts put before you that are unrelentingly attic, that will come straight to the point, but then you will have those texts that verge at times upon preciosity and euphism. And you're going to be asked to find, in a sense, a sensible balance between those two in response. And that's something that I do uh, think is interesting in res with respect to what we just discussed. Because now, if we come back to our choices and possibilities, what do we see? Let's look at these choices that I put out there. The first one that I said was indeed voice. So I said, what can you do? You have the active versus the passive. So we come back to this again. And what is then in that sense the choice? Well, in an active sentence, your actor undertakes whatever the activity of the verb is putting out there. So John murdered the butler, which if anyone who's familiar with the tradition of the great English murder mystery, that would be a twist because usually it's the butler who winds up doing it in those murder mysteries. Here you, he would be the victim, but okay, I, I digress slightly. Um, but John murdered the butler, that's an active sentence because John is undertaking whatever that activity is. However, it could be that what you're looking for is you want that to be switched. Now I said the first example of this, the, the key example in professional academic writing is to get rid of yourself. You know, I did X, X was done, those kind of things. But it can also be to just recreate a different focus. John murdered the butler. But I could also say, what's more interesting is who was murdered. The butler was murdered by John. And you do need to keep something in mind with sentences like this. I try not to throw people off with, in discussing voice as a grammatical principle with my own voice, because the thing is, when you speak, you actually lose a little bit of the need for this. Because in speaking, we can emphasize things by just stressing words. So you can say, yeah, but John murdered the butler. And then I don't have any need for a passive sentence. But in writing, you have to force the hand of your reader. You can't count on them to place the stress where you necessarily might have it in your, form, in your verbal expression. So that's why this becomes uh, uh, a clean and effective policy. And the other thing is, what did I also say? Sometimes all other things being equal, you want variety. You actually just want to do, use active and passive interchangeably to just make your text more dynamic. So that also helps. So, um, um, is it yes. uh, completely wrong to use has been instead of was? Okay. Is it grammatically wrong to say uh, the butler has been murdered by John? No, it's not. But now comes the question, why don't I use that here? Because that, because what you just said is not the equivalent of the other sentence. In other words, the whole point is, what do, you, what do we observe with the passive? 
if you switch from an active to a passive sentence, the only thing you're changing is the voice. You're only changing the direction in that sense of where you're putting the accent, but you're not changing the time frame. Okay. Now, the time frame of the first sentence is a simple past. The simple passive past tense of that verb, murdered, is was murdered. Right. Has been murdered is a perfectly correct uh, uh, sentence, but it says something different. And what is yeah. the, the active uh, form of the sentence? John has murdered the butler. Has murdered. Because then you get has murdered, has been murdered. And in fact, I'm going to come to that. Very, very soon, because, because, but I'm very glad you asked that, because that's one of the key things here, is that you have to keep in mind that if you start editing texts, you start looking to make those switches, that you don't, when it's direct, when it's passive versus active, you don't change the tense, that you don't change the time frame, because that can have a big effect. Let me ask you this. Uh, what is the difference between saying John was, uh, the butler was murdered by John and the butler has been murdered by John? It's subtle, but it's there. Basically, is it, is it uh, yeah. an, an sense of time? Yeah, it's the sense of time. That's exactly it. If you say John, uh, or the butler was murdered by John, it's historical. You're just saying something happened in the past. Butler's dead, he was murdered by John. But if you say the butler has been murdered by John, you're using what's called a present perfect form. And that draws it into the present. It's saying something started in the past, and it still has an effect on the present. So it would be, for example, the distinction uh, of saying, why don't you have any help? Well, the butler has been murdered by John. So he killed my help. Therefore, now I don't have any help because something happened in the past. Uh, it's the same, one of the things, I always say this is a great trick if you're writing, for example, anything about research or anything that relates to research or investigations, that the distinction between saying something like, uh, it was found and it has been found. Is that if you say it was found, it's historical. Then you're just listing all the things that happen to have been discovered in the past. But if you say something has been found, then you're saying it was discovered in the past, but it's relevant to what I'm going to be discussing right now. So, for example, if I say something, well, it has been discovered, then in fact, students who are learning a language tend to have differentiating levels of confidence as they progress then I'm saying that's relevant to you right now. So that's actually a very useful one to keep in mind. So in this sense, does versus subject undergoes. If you look at this, then if you start looking at things with more than one component, in the slide on voice, you have, say, three components, test, 50 candidates, research or assistant. I will point out some of my slides are very much aimed at, at this crowd. Some of them, I will admit, uh, I'm um, corrupted by my uh, more general uh, audience, which is usually uh, in the science realm. Um, look at this. Again, what do we say? We gave the test to 50 subjects. Then the accent is on we. By the way, I'm not saying that that should never be the case. I will point out that I said to you, objectivity requires certain language use, but sometimes you're required to express subjectivity as well. And in that case, you definitely want that first person. Uh, I can point out qualitative research, but also in that sense, even within judicial opinions, there is that moment where you step back and say, you talk perhaps about I as a person relative to I as a judicial authority. But you can also say the test was given to 50 sub candidates, but you can also say 50 candidates were given the test. And see, then the emphasis is again different. different. So in the second sentence, it's really about the test. But in the third sentence, it's really about the number of candidates. And see, that really then creates different levels of emphasis. And then, and this is where it really gets nice for you folks, now we come to the really interesting stuff. 
is you're often being required, and you don't even think about it really that way anymore. You're often required within the law, and certainly within uh, the context of being a jurist, so uh, someone uh, in the courts, to draw on numerous other authorities and to attribute to those other authorities. And the passive plus what we call reported speech, which I'm going to discuss shortly, plays into this in a big way. Because look at this type of sentence. Then you get things like this. So attribution of ideas. If you look at the slide for attribution of ideas, economists believe that X is greater than Y. You get a lot of these types of sentences. But then I can also say, it is believed that X is greater than Y. And I can also then say, X is believed to be greater than Y. And see, now I'm incorporating in that final sentence, or actually in the two that go, economists believe, that's very much an active sentence. You can use that, that's perfectly all right. But if you say, it is believed that X is greater than Y, that's creating what you'd call an existential it. It's an abstract idea. Then you're just putting out there, this is the belief. And you're leaving it, in that sense, I will say somewhat in the open as to who believes it. I'll point out that uh, years ago I was given a poster. It's a, it was a joke poster, and it was called Translating from Academies into English. And one of the phrases was said, it is believed, and the translation was, I believe. Then it said, it is widely believed, I believe it, and so does my thesis advisor. And the translation for it is generally believed was everyone in our department believes it. <laughs> so that kind of tells you that sometimes this can be a little bit of a rhetorical trick. But the fact is you can use that. So then you get it is believed and then you get your statement. But you can also break it down into saying I'm going to take one component from that thing and use that as a bridge. X is believed to be greater than Y. And now I've got a really nice, compact, compelling sentence. X is believed by many economists to be greater than Y. Then I've got attribution and passive and compact sentence. That's a really good construction to have because that's something that comes up all the time. You're constantly being asked to incorporate, as I said, the wisdom of others, the rulings of other par uh, parties and or organs, and also the knowledge of different fields into what it is that you yourself are talking about. Yeah, uh, then what you also have is, for example, this it formula. One thing I do want to point out is watch, if you look at this phrase, for example, the it formulation that I gave you, it is believed X, uh, is one that should be avoided if you have, say, six or seven different components in your session uh, sentence. So if you look at the sentence on the slide, where it says the it formulation is best if idea being attributed is not too unwieldy, the sentence I gave is too unwieldy. It doesn't actually work that well. If you start that with it is believed, then you're going to wind up with a whole bunch of, uh, basically a grocery list of beliefs. It would be best to then break that down into two constituent sentences. So it is believed that on the one hand that why given is, is, is significant, but it is mostly the case in the, when measured against L, M, and all, that kind of thing. You have to then come up with something other than what I, what I did. On the whole, by the way, I would also say if you filled in stuff in those letters, that sentence itself is a little bit of a nightmare. It's grammatically correct, but it would, it would stop most people's hearts. As I said, the last slide that I have on voice, then what you see is what does it do? So voice can eliminate you from the paper or from the ruling or from the discussion or whatever you happen to be uh, doing in terms of communication. Great, a greater sense of uh, distance and objectivity, be useful in improving clarity, and be useful in contributing to variety. So uh, in all of those points, it's something that meets the standard of what it was that we set out to do at the very beginning of the day. Now. In that respect, given the questions that were just asked, I think it's very interesting uh, where I'm going to go with the, the next few slides. Because then, in fact, what I want to look at is direction. So then if you look on the slide that starts to look at those possibilities, direction, then you'll see that that's where something distinctly different is taking place. 
noise, because what's the difference with direction? Voice is about changing the focus within the sentence. So you're saying, you're looking and you're saying, okay, it's about, you know, active versus passive. But when you're talking about direction, then you're actually talking about who's saying what to whom. And this is the distinction between what we call uh, direct and indirect language. Now, what's the problem with direct versus indirect language? Well, the problem is quite simple. And that is that you make a lot of shifts when you shift away from yourself as the speaker, but become someone else's speaker. Um, here, give you an example of this. If I say, um, there is no test in this, uh, there is no final exam in this course. That's my statement. There is no final exam in this course. If you were to say that to her one week from today, so if she asked you, what did Mark say about a final test? What would you say? That there will be no final exam in the course. Yeah, see, you're making a shift in tense. That's what I'm talking about. Because you wouldn't say, you wouldn't by necessity say there is no final test anymore. By the way, I'll point out in a minute that you actually can, but you generally, you shift to a different format. So for example, if you're thinking about this as something that is future-based, then you might use a future reference. You say, well, don't worry, Mark said that there, will, there won't be a final exam. So in the future, you're using my general statement and turning it into a future form. However, you could just as easily have made it historical. Well, last week, he said there would not be a final test. There, there was no final test for the course. You can make it a simple past. Because then you're talking, you're saying, what did he say at the time? You're just making a shift into the past tense. But in this case, I could argue, if it was one week from today, the course is still going on. Then you could also say there is no final test. He said there is no final test because what he stated was a universal. It's still true. So what you see there is you get a lot more complex, uh, a, a higher level of complexity. However, there are a few general things that you can always do with this. Now, the first thing I want to show you is how we make this bridge from what I was just discussing to what we're going to now. Because if you look at the first slide on direction, it's actually not really as much about direction as it is still about passive sentences and direction. Because what's being said, they say he is quite mad. Now, what can I do with that? They say he is quite mad. Maybe I don't want to talk about who said it. I just want to talk about what is being said. Then I would say, it is said that he is quite mad. Or, again, using our splitting up, I could look and say, what is being said? I'll split into two components. He is said, what is he said to be? To be quite mad. But why can I do this? If you look again, look at the slide. If the tense in the reported statement is the same as in the reporting clause, what's a reporting clause? Those are all those little mini sentences like he said, she stated, they pointed out, uh, it, it, they, this, uh, you know, Johnson argued, any phrase like that, that's called a reporting clause. It has a tense. In this case, it's basically a passive present, so it's present tense. If that sentence, that little sentence, has the same time denotation, the same tense as whatever's being said, he is quite mad, which is also in the present, then that latter case becomes an infinitive. He is said to be quite mad. But if You switch it up, they say he was quite mad. Now, the first one is they say. That's your reporting statement, your reporting clause. That's in the present tense. But the second one is not. It's in the past tense. Then 
what you see is you said, it is said that he was quite mad, that stays the same, you get the same type of construction, but that latter one, that then becomes, he is said to have been quite mad. And that's how they always work. So as soon as you have, if you have similarity, then you get an infinitive. If you have difference, then you get what's called a perfective infinitive, to have been. You see how it works? And I said, this is, this is a complex one, but it's also. And again, they argued that this is the case. This was argued, this is argued to have been the case. See? They stated that this was relevant to law. This was, our, this was stated to be relative, relevant to law because now it's consistent. But, yeah, but can you tell something more about the uh, content of the differences between the one and the, for the, 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 the meaning differs when you well, use yeah. the, it, 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 it's not, it has not the same meaning when you say, the, when you use the one, uh, when you, the infinitive or the perfective <laughs> infinitive. It, it uh, changes the yeah, meaning because, of the, but, but that's the thing, it has to. And what it's changing is it's showing you that there's an inconsistency. So basically what you're saying is you're pointing out that if, uh, that in, as soon as you give a perfective infinitive, then you're saying whatever, whatever tense you have in your reporting phrase is not the tense that was used in the, in the other one. So basically you can, can assume if something is being said in, uh, stated as being in the, pre uh, in the present, but you get a to have been kind of construction, then what you're looking at is something that was probably stated to have been in the past. Now, in this case, this I will absolutely point out to you, you had an objection about vague. The one thing you do have to be careful about with all reported speech, and this is why, in fact, in many, in legal argument, you often see direct citation and not as much indirect citation is this is an area where ambiguity can become a real big issue. In other words, the degree to which one thing means one or the other thing. To give you an example of this, say I say something like this. This is a straightforward reported construction, so it's not even as fancy as this. Um, I was a teacher for 25 years. Now, if I said that and someone reported on that weeks later, what would they say? Well, how do you shift a past tense in a reported speech? You usually get a past perfective. And I have a, I have a schema for this. I'm going to show it to you folks, so don't worry about that. So then you get, what did Mark say? Mark said that he had been a teacher for 25 years. But what if I said something different? What if I had said in class, I have been a teacher for 25 years? The reported speech of that would be exactly the same. He said that he had been a teacher for 25 years. So now it's no longer clear whether I'm still a teacher at the moment of speech or not. And that can be problematic. So that's one that you have to absolutely watch out for. And in that sense, you have to also guard when you're looking at other people writing texts for you or to you, you say, yeah, but what was literally said? If it's not going to become clear from what's said in that statement, you might want to rephrase that. Or in that sense, uh, uh, add, for example, editorial remarks that you know that that you know at the time he stated that he had been a teacher for 25 years. That kind of suggests still going on at that moment. Mm -hmm. So then you would have then you would assume it has been as close as it was. But I said that's something you have to watch for. So indirect or reported speech break this down, look at it more directly. If we look at direction, so the slide there, indirect versus direct speech, what do you see? Indirect or reported speech contains a reporting clause and a main clause consisting of the statement being reported. Sam said, what did Sam say? That he did not like green eggs and ham, which is, uh, which is actually an infamous miscitation of anyone who knows English children's literature. Uh, it, it was Sam who actually liked green eggs and ham. It was the other guy he was talking to who refused them consistently. But I have my moments of odd 
humor and also having uh, raised someone to the age of 26. I feel I have a certain license when it comes to children's literature. Um, so first of all, what's that component? What does it say there? You have reporting speech as a reporting clause. So yeah, you have all these things, these reporting verbs that are out there. It's things like to say, to argue, to object, to respond, to claim, and see, this is what I was saying. Keep this in mind, though, that when you do this, there is also a further kind of thing that can be confusing, and that is that you, uh, you have to, first of all, also keep in mind that some verbs are transitive. Now, dig back to high school English or Latin, <laughs> because that's an issue there as well. What do transitive verbs require? that intransitive verbs do not. The word kind of says it's transiting from one to another. What do you need in a transition like that? Transitive verbs always need an indirect object. So in other words, you can say something, period. He said this was not the case. But you can't tell something, period. You have to tell someone something. You always need a target in a transitive verb. So as soon as you get verbs, in this case, uh, like to tell or to ask, you always have to ask someone something. You have to tell someone something. So that has to be incorporated. So in other words, even when you're reporting, Jack told Jill that this was the case. But Jack said that this was the case is possible because you don't have to involve an indirect object. And the other thing is that there are a couple of verbs that actually don't work in reported speech in the sense of you have a reported speech version of them, but then they basically become the ing form of themselves. So, for example, words like deny and suggest, you don't actually say something like, you generally don't say John suggests, suggest, uh, or what was I looking for? Uh, Right. You don't say something like, John suggested that we should go to this. You would say something like, John suggested going. Then you get these really, you don't, he, you don't say he denied that he had been there at that time. He denied being there at that time. So then what you get is the reporting verb is all right, but as a reporting verb, it makes it impossible to follow it with a regular reported speech formulation. So you always wind up with them one of these ing kind of things. So deny, deny doing, suggested going, et cetera, et cetera. 